Good morning, everyone. Once more, how are you guys doing to doing today? Let's get started off with today. And there are a few uh, questions already in the chat. Okay, let's try to take some of them before we get started off with the day. Um, one is on uh, OOPS concept. So, what is this whole OOPS concept? Okay, so OOPS concept is very simple. Okay, so it thrives on the whole concept of using classes and objects. What are these classes and objects in the first place? So when we were having initially the programming, right? So we were having it primarily writing lots of lots of bulky lines of code, but we were not able to reuse it multiple times, right? So we already have touched base some of the oops concept, like say functions, modules, and stuff, right? So we already saw that we are creating reusable lines of code, right? So uh, and you're gonna what you're gonna have is that you're gonna define classes when you're gonna create any kind of objects inside uh, Python and Java. So what that happens is that whatever you define inside that particular classes, the visibility of those classes, those uh, data structures is going to be visible only within that class, right? So the other ones will not even know, anyone accessing from outside will not even know what is happening inside. So uh, it will do its function and then give out the you know, whatever is required. Okay. So the whole concept of OOPS is embedded within each and every paradigm of whatever you have in Java. Okay. Okay. Um, my voice is not audible. Is it better now? I just switched off my fan or rather actually turned it down. Is this better now? And uh, some people were asking about the uh, polls questions. Okay. So this uh, polls will know. I checked with the Minds team as well on the same question. And uh, polls is not applicable for the Python sessions because this is a continuous session that we are having for uh, the throughout the weekend uh, tectonic sessions. We are going to not be having poll questions for this one. Okay. So this is a more of a continuous learning uh, sessions that we're having. So poll questions are primarily going to be there for those guest lecture sessions that you're going to have. Okay. So that you already have it. Right. Sounds good. Okay, so what is double loop? Double loop is nothing. Uh, so you have an if loop and then internal to the if loop, you need to find out and another insight, you need to create multiple conditions inside. So if you're gonna have embed multiple if loop things, right? So it is called double loop, that's all. Okay, so you're gonna run, say for example, you have to traverse through two lists. So for a list starting from one to 10, and then inside that you need to traverse through one another list starting from list number, 20 to 40, you need to do it. So then it will take all possible combinations of one, and then you will traverse through the all possible combinations of the list, second list. Okay, so that's how it is uh, double loop. Okay, so very simple. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's get started with our classes for today. So we kick started uh, last time around on the basics of modules and also on try final loops right so um to save some time so what i've done is i already written some code and kept it ready for you so that you can quickly run through it okay uh let me share my screen and then you should be able to see it okay are you able to see my screen guys yep okay so what you're going to do first is that we're going to see three important things um in the first one now Okay, and then in the next 40, 45 minutes till 12.45, we are going to be looking into another big concept called Pandas. Okay, so what I'll be doing is we'll try to finish this one off till before 12. I'll give you a quick five minute break and then we'll uh, start off with another concept called Pandas. So we need to uh, finish off Pandas, uh, at least the basic work on Pandas. Okay, so that in the last class that you're going to meet up next week, we should be able to do some use case on real data. Okay. So let's get going. Okay. And I'll take all your questions um, at the end of whatever we are able to finish off uh, at the 11.55 mark. Okay. So once I've completed this whole stuff, then we will come back and I'll take your questions. Then we'll take a five minute break. We'll jump onto pandas and uh, We'll try to see if we can complete the pandas basic stuff. Okay, awesome. So, just a quick recap: uh, we started off with Python programming, basics of Python, data structures. What are the data structures which are specific to Python? We saw lists, dictionaries, um, uh, some and 
uh, some of the ones which are going to be very specific to Python and how they are working, right? So what are its advantages and disadvantages, right? And then we saw how does that logical uh, expressions work, how is if block works, how for block works, uh, while uh, iteration works. And we also uh, quickly saw about um, typecasting, right? So if you're getting a data from a different type, how will I change the type and then use it inside my program? Right? So all those stuff we saw. And then we saw a lot of string manipulations, string uh, updations and all this stuff. And then finally, we touched upon functions, right? So what are functions? We are going to have reusable piece of code, which are going to be used multiple times inside your code. We are going to be using functions to do that for us, right? So then we saw about um, try and final block, right? So try finally block and accept block helps you to do error handling. So we'll be doing a use case today um, on how to combine try finally and exception handling, okay? And how do you build on to exception handling? I'll teach you how to do that, okay? Um, and once you're done with that, uh, what we're gonna do today is we're gonna try to see how do we access files from your computer, right? How do you take a file, any text file and read your files? How do you do that? right so that we're going to do okay so coming to yes one question is how do i do for csv files i'll take that when we go to pandas that's an easier way to do that in pandas so i'll be doing that in pandas okay um so you will be using uh some of the file handling in basic structures without using pandas so we'll be doing that now okay so that's the plan for today so we're going to do file handling then look into the modules and then we are going to do some file exceptions okay Sounds good. So what I will do now is I want you guys to follow through with whatever I'm trying to do. So I'll save this file and upload it into my Google Drive so that you can download it and navigate it through as I'm doing it. Okay, will that work? So let me just stop my share quickly and then navigate to my Google Drive and upload it over there. Okay, I've pinged you the link of the folder. Can you please confirm to me if you're able to access the folder with the files? Please go ahead and download all the files over there. Okay. I think I have kept a couple of DAT files, an output file, and a TXT file, and an IPNB file, and two .dot I I'm not sending it. I'm giving you. Oh, okay. Hold on. I think I've given you. Two. Yeah. Are you able to get the link now? Please check and let me know if you're able to get the files. Sounds good. So let me go ahead and open up my screen. So it should be good. Okay. So please download the file, keep it in whichever directory you want, preferably the directory where you are loading your Jupyter notebook so that you do not have to worry about your current working directory. If you have kept it in any other place, it's fine. I'll tell you how to change your current working directory also. Okay. Okay. Awesome. First thing first, once you've downloaded the file um, to your working directory, open up your Jupyter Notebook and open the file, this one, JNUST underscore session eight. Okay. So here you will see the first line of code, import OS. I'm just importing a package called OS. What does this package helps me is that it will help me to get my current working directory. So get CWD is going to get my current working directory. I'm putting it into a variable and I'm just printing that variable. Okay, so you can see that my current working directory is C drive users and Yashi. Okay, so it might be different for you, right? So it might be different wherever your Python notebook is installed. Okay, so run the first line of code and find out where your current working directory is. So what I find is most of the people find it difficult where I have launched my Jupyter notebook. How will I change it, sir? Where will I? Where am I working on it, sir? How do I move the files to this current working directory, sir? How do I find my current working directory, sir? So all these questions we are going to try to answer here, right? So you are going to find your current working directory here. Okay. The simplest way is there are two ways to go about it. Move all your Python notebook files to the current working directory so that you do not have to worry about giving any path. Okay. You can just give file1.txt if your file is existing inside this directory, c users yashin. 
So if you're going to have under C drive, let me just share my screen. Sharing my entire screen so that you will be able to see it. So if I'm going to go to my C drive, users and Yashi. Okay. So if I'm going to put all my IPNB files, all the files that I need for my project, everything inside this file, at no point in time, you would need to worry about appending your file name with this directory structure. This is called relative directory structure, right? So you don't have to give an absolute directory structure at all, right? Okay, now the next question that you will ask me is, sir, Yashin folder is having so many files, sir. Can I create a folder inside this Yashin and can I access that file, right? So can I access that file, but how do I refer that when I call this particular file? So what you need to do is, if you are going to have your file in a completely different folder, then see for example here, see users Yashin and then under that, I have a Python folder and there that I have session one folder and then in a file one.txt. So if you want to give the full structure of your folder, you can give it. This is fine. Okay. No doubts about it. Or your current working directory can be replaced by a dot. Okay. So your dot will replace your current working directory, whatever is this. So you can mention that dot is my current working directory. From there, I have a folder, Python. From there, I have a session one folder, and then I have a file one.txt. Simple. So it is important that you need to find out what's your current working directory, and then you need to store your files according to it. Okay, so Dhananjay has tried to answer some of the ones that I had. Sounds good. Yep, thank you, Dhananjay. Perfect. So there we have. Okay, so now you can either call like this, or if you are going to put the full length of the folder path, you can put your full folder path. File one.txt, I have already given it to you. Ensure that you have a file one.txt. So file one, session one, I have a file one.txt. If you open that file one inside your local folder, you can see that it has some text file. Right. So if I want to read a text file into my Python notebook, you can do that. So what I'm trying to do. So closing and opening of files can be done using called as open function. Okay. So what does this do is open helps you to read all these type of files, txt files, csv files, xls file also, doc file, docx, dat, output file, and sql file. Right. So you can easily read and open any of your file that you would want. Okay. Uh, you, you know, to open a file, you need to mention open method. Okay. Open method. And within the bracket, you need to mention the file name, including the path where it is going to be found. And what are you going to do with that file? Are you going to read the file or are you going to write the file? Are you going to append the file? Append the file means you're going to add contents into the file. Okay. I'm just reading the file here. So what I'm going to do is for some value in F. So basically, moment I put this one, my cursor goes to the first line of this file, which is nothing but it goes here. You see the cursor blinking there? Like that, it will go and stand. Okay. So then what it does is try to print each line and then it will close. Okay, if you are not going to use the closed method, then this file will run and it will open up, but it will consume your memory allocations. Okay, so ensure that you always use a close method to close your file. Okay, so if you run this, you can see that the text file that you have in your local notebook can be read inside your Jupyter notebook. This is how you read files into your Jupyter. Okay, so 
So if you're getting an error, like I told to you, the only reason would be this file one dot txt wouldn't have been in the folder that you are mentioning, isn't it? So this folder is going to be specific to me. You, you will not obviously have this folder structure inside yours. So check in which folder you are having, change the folder structure and ensure that you are having a backward slash differentiating between the different folders. So only then it will work. If you're going to have a slash like this, it will throw an error. So have it like this. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. So now we have read the file. Now we have next, next question someone will ask me is there a, how do I change the current working directory? I am, I don't want to every time go and give a full path or I do not even want to give a dot path. I have created a new project, sir. I want to move my all new folders files that I create into that particular folder only. And whenever I open a file, open a notebook, it should not open into C drive users. Okay. So it should not use, it should not go to C users Yashin and open a file. It should open automatically into a new project folder, sir. Okay. Yes, you can do that. So this is the next line of code. Same thing. You get your working directory. If you want to change your directory, put a chdir change directory and put whatever folder that you want. So I have put it into the folder, like say where I have kept all the files for today's session and I put that folder. And then if you want to list your directory, then you can run it and see that your whole directory has changed. And list directory, what it's going to do is it's going to list what are the files that I have in the directory. Okay. So if I go to the file, you see that all the files which are there. I have it listed here. You do not even have to go to your directory to see it. You can see, run, run this command in your Jupyter notebook and you'll be able to find the list of files inside your directory. Okay. IPNB file is not opening for you. Okay. Guys, can you confirm that if your IPNB file that I sent now is working fine? Interesting. So, okay, so yeah, it's opening. Okay, sounds good. So if you want an uh, HTML file, I'll save that as well. Okay, so that's fine. The lightning file should work for you. Give me a second, I'll upload that file as well. So how do you import a file? Okay, click on file, click on open. It will go and show you the directory. Select the file that you want. Okay, so if I put it into this file, so this was the day one, whatever file you had, right? So create the select the file and then click on I open this file, it will open up for you. Okay, so this was where did I say this file? Current working directory was under session one. Right, so I will click it here. Yeah, so you can open it from there, it will open up for you. Okay. So, that's good. so let me start off with my next part. Okay. Perfect. So let's start with the rest part, rest of the class. Okay. So, uh, okay. You're good. Are you sure? Okay. Perfect. Next one. Now, there is, in the folder that I've given you, there is a file called mymodule.py. Okay. Just right click on that module and open it into a notepad or a text pad, okay? And see what is it my module have, okay? So let's go to the folder that I gave you. There's my module.py, right click on it. And I'm just opening it up with a text pad or a notepad, okay? So I'm just opening it up with a notepad. Okay. So what does this contain? Can someone read and tell me what's this happening? What does this have? Okay, so module functions, very good. Okay, so there are two functions which I have defined and I have saved it as a .py file. It's nothing but an executable Python file, okay? So there are a lot of questions that were asked in my earlier class telling that, sir, I have created a Python file in uh, PyCharm, right? Uh, so I have used it in IDE and I created a Python file. So how do I run it in a Jupyter? Okay, so that's that's what you're trying to do here, right? So it doesn't matter where you have written your Python code, right? So if you have written it in 
PyCharm or anything and you have saved it as a .py file and if you're going to send that file to uh, someone or put it into a common repository, okay, so you have shared it into a common uh, Google repository or OneDrive repository, okay, so just imagine this particular my, my module is there in some shared drive, okay, like I have shared it to you in your Google Drive, right, so like this I have kept it in a shared drive, so I have given you two functions, okay, so one is say hi function and there is an another function which is called factorial function okay say hi function is a very simple one if i call this function it's just going to print hi this is a function of my module that's all okay then second function if i call this function factorial function it's going to take a number as an input always remember it's it's going to take a number okay then it's setting a product as one and for i in range of numbers, so range range of numbers, if I'm passing phi, it's going to take range of 0 to 5, okay, or rather 1 to 5, right? So then it's going to say, um, it will take from 0 to 5, and then it's a product 1 into 0 plus 1. So it's going to be 1 into 1, then it will go to the next one, and then keep multiplying the product. So it's going to take 1 into 2, into 3, into 4, into 5, right? So I just put 1 i plus 1, just to ensure that. Uh, 0 is not counted again. That's all. Okay. If I put i, then it will multiply by 0 for the first number and you'll get an output of 0. That's all. So it will print the total product. So if I give a passage as number of 6, then it is going to give 1 into 2 into 3 into 4 into 5 to 6. So and then I'm printing the product and I'm returning the product. So I'm just, actually it's going to print two times then. So it's going to print once. And if I return it also, it's going to print the value in the Jupyter number. So it will two times it will show the same value. Okay. All that I'm trying to do is I'm finding out the factorial of a number. So given a number, uh, say 4, then it's going to say 4 into 3 into 2 into 1. It's going to find it out. So if I'm going to say 100, it's going to say 100 into 99 into so long till 1. So it's going to find out the factorial for that. So I have passed, created two functions and I've saved it as some module name dot py and I've given it into a pass it and given it to someone in a shared drive. Okay. So now you need to use that one. Okay. See this. Okay. From my module. Okay. Import star. Import star means you're going to import all the functions inside your my module. Okay. That means you're importing say hi function and also the factorial function. Okay. The moment you say this, you are, don't even have to define your function in any part of your code here, right? So for a layman person looking into your code, they will not know what is that function, where is that function defined? You, want, you can keep it secretively stored inside one common folder where you are have to have your business logic. You do not have to expose it inside your code at all. So from my module import star will import all the functions which you are defined. So any business logic that you need to define inside your functions, you can keep it secure and safe within that particular code, right? So your code will not even display to your end user what is it trying to do. So I'm just passing print say hi. Okay, so I'm just removing this first. I'm just showing you the first one. Okay. You see that I have not written any code for say hi function, but I am importing the my module, which is there inside the folder, my current working directory. So obviously you can change your working directory if you're keeping it inside your Google Drive. So you need to access that and keep it there, right? So the moment you're able to do that and then print that particular module function, the function will get called, right? So very, very important thing is you do not have to run or write the function code inside your deck again, right? So inside your Jupyter notebook, you do not even have to specify anything. You can reuse this modules and run it inside your code, right? So now just see this. In my code line, I don't even have the code for the function for finding out the factorial. All that I'm trying to do here is I'm getting an input, input and within the parenthesis is going to get an input from the user. So when I run this particular code, what is going to happen is this first line, it will show up a text box 
and it will ask me to enter a number. Okay. So it will say enter a non negative number. It's asked you to enter a number. Then what I'm trying to do, I'm just ensuring that whatever number I'm I, I entering it, I'm converting it into an int. Okay. So you can do it here or you can also add it as here. Okay. So I'm, to make, make it easy for you to understand, I'm just making it here so that number that you are entered is converted and stored as an integer. Okay. I'm passing that number as a value to the factorial function that I have created inside my module. So I have this module. So the moment, where is that module? So the moment I call this factorial, this function is getting called inside this my module, which is there inside my local drive. It will execute this line of code. And then my final factorial number will get printed. Okay, let me see if it runs. Class me. I'm just trying to see if I can do a simple one first. See, this is for the print and this is for the return. Okay, so that is the reason why it's printing twice. So five factorial, 120. So if I want to run, check for a bigger number. See, it's working fine, All right? So are you guys able to understand? How to create a module? We saw it last class, right? So we have covered it on how to create a module in the last class. So check the code there, okay? Don't worry, Pravi, I'll repeat it, okay? So exactly, any Python file can be imported as a module. Exactly, if you're sharing the program, the module should be given um, or it can be, at least stored in a common place where it can be read. Okay. And you can access control on the modules also. So you don't have to worry about it. Okay. Perfect. So just to recap, guys, um, let me try to show you easy way for you to understand. Okay. In a white book. Yeah, I'll come to that. Um, so I good question, Akshat. I'll come to that. Okay. Sounds good. So just imagine that you have written a function to validate a particular password is entered correctly according to the norms uh, listed inside for your bank. Okay. So obviously, when you enter your user ID password, uh, a function call is being made about whenever you write a password, right? So it will have to check inside. So the moment you write a user ID and password, user ID and password, right? So what happens? Uh, it goes and calls a function, okay? And it validates the business logic is getting triggered. And it says that first it will verify if the user ID, user ID is correct and matches with the one which is there in the repository. And then when it goes to the password, it will check if the password is valid with the one that is there, right? All right. So this is a simple function that you have, right? To validate it, right? So, or else if you're going to change your uh, password and you create a new password, okay? So that's a different function which has been created, right? So to create a password, you're gonna have uh, it should enter that it has numbers inside it, it should have capital letters inside it, it should have at least one small letters inside it, it should have one uh, special characters inside it. All this you're going to define it inside a function, right? And it should have number of letters, it's going to be minimum eight of them should be there. All this you're going to write it into a function, okay? So you have two functions defined here. And this is the same thing that you as a company-wide policy, you're going to be having this for the, all the applications. So you do not have to run, to write this code every single time, right? So you probably have new password function created, and this is user ID password validation function created. Okay. And these two, you can put it inside a password module. Okay. And this, you can probably store it inside a uh, password protected common drive inside your company. Okay. So what you can do is anyone who wants to create, say, I'm creating a new web page. Okay. 
and I'm taking a person to enter a user ID and password. I do not have to run this, create this logic inside my code. All that I have to do is I just have to call this module and use these two functions. And that's enough, right? So all that I'm going to do is import, import password module, right? Star. So it will import all the functions inside it. And directly, whenever this person user ID and password is entered, what I'm going to do is I'm going to get input is a user ID, enter your password. So what I'm going to do is like this. So in input, enter your user ID, input, enter your password, right? So how will it look like? Like say, for example, if I'm going to enter, this is how your internal code will look like, right? So enter your user ID, okay? So this is going to be stored inside your user ID, right? So this will be stored inside your user ID. And then you will get your password also, right? So I'm going to start it. So I'm going to enter user ID, enter here. So what you're going to do is once you get, get take the user and password, then you're going to import the module from module wherever it is. So I'm going to have it like this inside it. From password module, import star. So you're going to have both the functions imported into it. So then inside it, what will I do? I'm going to check the user ID and password, right? So what I'm going to do is, what's the function name I, I created it last time? So I'm just creating password validation, right? So password validation. I'm going to pass the user ID comma password that I have got from there, right? And then what will happen is I've not even written any code for this, but I'm going to reuse whatever is there inside my module, right? So password validation, it will pass the user ID and password into it, and it will throw out an error if there's an error. And if there's an error, I'll print it out to the user, right? So similarly, I'll call a function called as when you have a new password creation, I'm going to say, I'm going to collect the old password and then I'm going to collect the new password, right? And then call the function, right? That's how you code it internally. Are you guys able to understand? Now, I uploaded in the same folder, Tanish, with the HTML file. So you can take it from there. Okay. Perfect. So now there is a question about what is this print command and what is this difference between the print and the return? Okay. So print is just imagine that you are um, printing something back to the user, right? So if you are calling the particular function or code and if it's displaying out something onto your front end, then it is called print command. Return is you are returning back to the person who's calling it. Okay. So just imagine this, right? Num factorial is equal to factorial num. Okay. And then I'm printing this. So if I'm just going to remove this, I'm not printing the code. Okay. So I'm going to say 22. You can see that this value is the answer. Okay. And this value is actually stored inside num factorial. It is returned back to the person who's calling that and this who's calling it factorial num is being called. That's where the factorial function is called. And it is being stored inside num factorial. What is stored inside num factorial is whatever you return from this particular function. So if you're not going to use return, then it will not get stored here. So if I go and check what is there inside this variable, you'll find that the return value, whatever you are returned from here, you're returning the product. This is going to get stored inside the variable. Okay. Make sense. Exactly. So if you're collected old password and new you need to, uh, okay. I'll repeat it one more time. Okay. See here, you are calling a function and you're passing the number here, right? So we'll see what's happening inside the code. You're calling a function and it takes the number. 
if you're not returning it it will only display it outside the output okay so if i'm not going to have this then what will happen in the code is it will just display it outside but it will not return it back to the person who's calling it so here who's calling it factorial number is being called but who's calling it it's storing inside num factorial right so only if you return the this will be replaced by the return value so factorial num what is the return value the factorial of that number that number that you are returning back from the function that number will get stored inside your num factorial and that is why when i call num factorial you're getting this value okay got it so printing it is just printing it out exactly which was why you were correct which was so that's the easier way of doing it so you don't have to run int of num to make it easy for people to understand i wrote it like that so if you want to do it like this you can just put it inside your hint also so this will also work okay fine okay awesome guys um perfect so now let's move on to the important one of try exception block okay stay with me for the try exception we started doing this yesterday so let's see this particular snapshot that i have for you okay so let me just minimize this okay we saw last time around is that we're going to use try and accept and then finally for all piece of code right so what you're going to do is try is going to have the code that you want to be run except is going to contain when you run into an exception here then execute this okay when there is no exception else run this finally always gets executed this is what you need to always remember okay so try running this code if you run into exception run the one is under exception and otherwise run this finally run this okay let me try to tell you how it works okay very simple use case let me start off with a very simple one i'm going to say try 1 by 0 1 by 0 is going to give you a zero division error you're dividing it by zero right so it is going to throw one zero division error right so try running 1 divided by 0 if you run into an exception then you need to run the one which is written written inside the except so if you run into except zero division error as e which is a standard format this is how you write it you're going to print the error okay so see here it's telling 1 divided by 0 except run division by error so if you're not going to use this what's going to happen let's see so if you're going to run like this you're going to have an error like this right and your whole code will stop executing and it will you will your code will throw an unintended error and your code will crash so for your whole program to continue executing we are trying to catch all possible exceptions and trying to bring them to a closure that's how the intention is so try something if you run into an exception print this error right that's what i'm trying to do I'll try it. So, is it should be? Yeah, is it should be capital error? Correct. It's wrong here. So zero should be capital. Your this one is kept as small zero here. Okay. Perfect. So now, see here. i'm dividing it and i'm putting it into x okay i'm going to run into an error then if you want to tell to the customer telling that there was some issue okay you can do that it will print whatever you want you do not have to print only the predefined error there you can print whatever you want to be displayed to the customer telling that the transaction was not successful okay there was some issue transaction was not if you want to do this so if you whenever you enter an error then if you want to display this error message you can do that this is what happens whenever you work with any of the programs right so any of the live web applications or something so whenever you are making an online payment or something like that when you run into an error 
they display back something that your money was been deducted, but it is uh, there was an issue with your transaction, right? So this is the how your exception block gets captured and is shown back to the customer. Okay, you write it inside your exception block. Okay, sounds good. So next one here, if you don't know what is the type of an exception that you are going to get, okay. This is the most simplest thing code that I you can find out. Okay, so what it will do is it will find out what is the class of the error, and it will also tell you what is this error. Okay, so I normally what I do is if you have some code that you've written, but you don't know what is the error that you might probably run into, right? But probably you don't know you, when you write a code, you will not be able to foresee what is the error that you might probably be able to run into right so you typically uh, write the code and then you want to find out what possible scenarios that this error is happening right so what i probably normally do is that in this error if i put this code it will give me the class of code that will happen and what is the code that, what is the error that's happening so when i roll out my code into a beta testing or for um, end users testing or something, I'll ask them to play around with the functionality. They will probably try to break the code as much as possible. And what that is works to your advantage, right? So you will be able to find out whenever they are trying to do, you can find out what are the different uh, lines they are trying to do, what how they are trying to break the code. And you will find all the classes of errors that you might probably get into, right? So once you have all this, Instead of my, me breaking my head and writing the code for all possible options, I'll pick all the possible options of errors that I've got in my beta testing and I'll add them into the exception block. Okay, so that's the easiest way to do it. Okay, so that's okay. So then you can, for each exception, what do you want to display to the customer? You can change it. Okay. Yes, so end of file passing, you will get an error when you're not closing it. So once you close the file properly, you'll be fine. Okay, sounds good. So I've just written it, whatever I've shown it in the JPG file here. Okay, okay. so one person wants to ask, how do I insert a JPG file? Very simple, uh, change it into markdown, okay? And then click on edit, insert image, choose the file that you want to add. And go to your file so I was having it inside here. So select the file and click on it, you get the JPG file. Okay, add it into it. You can embed the file. Okay, sounds good. Okay, let's come back. Now, this is how a typical code will look like when I'm trying to create a function. So I'm creating a function to divide two numbers x comma y. I'm going to divide x by y. Okay, So I'm creating a function division x comma y. So you're going to divide x divided by y. Okay, And you're going to try to foresee what are the different errors that you will get and you're going to create an exception function over there. Okay, So now I'm just telling result is equal to none. Nothing but result is nothing but a, I'm not I mean, having an empty set over there. Try result is equal to x by y. It's going to divide x and y and it's going to store it into result. If you run into an exception, print the exception and the what is the exact exception that has occurred. If there is no exception, then print the result of x divided by y is the result. So you can do it. Okay. Then always remember the finally is the part of code which will get executed. Okay. Status is equal to none. Okay. If not result, if there is no result, then status is equal to fail. Otherwise, put this false. Okay, so I'm dividing three divided by zero. You can see that exception got executed and division by zero has occurred. So three divided by zero is a error, right? Sounds good. Um, so this is a very simple one. You can probably able to write it down. Okay. Now I want you guys to implement the modules and functions that we have learned now. Okay. You need to write a code to check the validity of a password password uh, given by the user. So first line of code should be to get the password from the customer. And then you need to validate. 
you need to have at least one letter between A to Z, one letter between capital A and Z, one number between 0 and 9, and at least one character between these three special characters. And minimum length is six characters, and maximum length is three, three characters. Okay. I've given you a hint as well here. We are actually using regular expressions here, right? So search for RE as the package. Okay. So if you search for RE package in Python, okay. So go to the so, docs.python library okay so go to this regular function you will be able to find out what are the regular functions how do you write it okay so scroll down you will be able to find out how do you search you need to import the regular function and how do you search for it right so there will be an example course which will be given to you on how to implement the RE regular function okay so use it i want you to read it and try to implement the password function. I'll obviously give you the code. Don't worry. Obviously, I'll give you the code. Uh, so, but I want you to try it out. Okay. So, the flower bracket is if you want to and do not want to uncomment out and directly pass the value, then that's where your flower bracket is used. Okay. So, exception occurred is within a square double quotes, right? So, within that, if you want to uh, not if you want to define uh, output and uh, out, uh, output from the code into that, then you use a flower bracket except. So you are just escaping from the double quotes. Okay, that's why the flower bracket. You can see it in the result of x divided by y also, you are using flower bracket, right? So that's one way to do it. Okay. Otherwise, you need to, every time you need to use double quotes, close it, and then mention x, and then double quotes divided by, then mention y. So that is one method we already seen. This is another method how you can define. Okay. Sounds good. Perfect. No, Vishwa, don't share the answer. Keep it with you. We'll discuss it on next Sunday. Okay. Because it's the one, the moment anyone shares the answer, and then uh, other one, other people will not try it. Okay. So please, I want everyone to try it and come back on next week. Okay, because it's going to be new for some of them for using the regular expression. So let them try that. Okay, sounds good. So let's get started off with pandas. So pandas here we are. Perfect. So we saw different types of uh, data structures so far, right? And uh, pandas is the main go to function or rather package, right? So which is going to be used for data analysis in Python. Okay, so we have done all the basic work in Python so far. And now we are going to step into the main one, which is called Pandas. Okay. It's a fundamental package. Um, so what is this called? Why is it called fundamental package? Because it gives you data in the form of rows and columns that we have been wanting from right from the start. Right. So now it is going to have it like a straight spreadsheet. And it also has a lot of capabilities to play around with like a data structure. Right? So you can use the inbuilt list, dictionaries, and everything as well. But on add on, add on top of it, you can have a lot of additional benefits also that comes with Pandas itself. Okay? But always remember that when you import Pandas as a package, you need to also import NumPy. NumPy is what nothing but is called numerical Python. Okay? So NumPy is like say for example is numpy has inbuilt arrays concept and everything under okay so i'm not going to go into the needs of uh, the numpy in detail but we'll talk about it as we go about in pandas okay what are the main things that you should know about right so you should it has a tabular data structure so it can contain the same data inside and also the heterogeneous data that's a big advantage that we have and it is also having an inbuilt indexing capability so you can only know the number or the index, the first row or the second row or the third row. You do not even have to know what is the value inside. Okay. You can group by the whole data inside based upon a column. Like say, for example, I have a whole sales data and I want to group by the whole the data in the format of years. So you can group by years and then do it. So it will be easy for you to do it. You can gives you a lot of capabilities to do time series analysis and cross-sectional data. So there are different types of data. I'm not going to go into this data types, but 
you can have point in time data, time series data, cross functional data, all this can be analyzed using pandas. Okay. And you don't have to worry so much about your string manipulations and all the stuff when you, if you know pandas. So it will take care of it on its own. Okay. So how do I install pandas? If you are using any other IDE, you need to go and install pandas uh, from your package manager, but you do not have to worry about it when you are using Anaconda because it is installed already. So all that you need to do is import pandas. Okay. So how do I import pandas? Very simple. But we know that NumPy is pandas is built on top of NumPy. So I need to first import NumPy as np and then import pandas as pd. As pd is nothing but this for alias form, alias name. Okay. So first time when you run it, it's going to take some time. After that, it will be fine. Okay. So it just run these two lines. You should be able to import pandas and NumPy. There are basically two different data structures inside the pandas. One is series, okay, and the other one is called data frame. Okay, so series is nothing but a uh, n-dimensional array. Okay, so I'm not going to be discussing much on the series because it's not, you know what is array is, and you guys have done it in C programming and in Java. So I'm skipping that of series. I'm going to directly jump into what is called as data frame. Okay, so let's try to understand what is this data frame in Pandas. Okay, it's data frame is nothing but a table or data structure in which data can be laid out in rows and columns format. Just imagine a SQL file or a CSV file or an XLS file. Okay, so it again can contain both homogeneous and heterogeneous values. That is mean you don't you can have the same type of value or a different type of values. Okay, um, so now you can also have it that you can also have indexing also done for the data frames. Okay. So let's see how it looks like. Okay. Like say, for example, I'm going to create a data frame. Okay. You are going to tell me what am I using internally to create the data frame? I'd be using already defined data structures or already taught data structures inside to create a data frame. Okay. So PD dot data frame, I've created pandas as pd so pd dot data frame okay within the parenthesis is going to create a data frame for me so within the data frame i need to mention what i'm going to have inside the data frame okay i'm opening a curly braces what is curly braces is for what data structure am i going to create if i'm going to use curly braces Very good, dictionary, right? So what am I gonna use? Say I'm defining key and the value pair, right? So I'm gonna say 95 comma 24 comma 4. So what is the key? Key is the price and value is 95, 24, 45, 67, right? Got it? So I'm just gonna press comma, okay? And say I'm gonna say something. And then uh, this one, I'm gonna say name some companies. Okay, so Google. Just imagine this is stock prices. Okay. So, okay, so let me just close this out and run it. Price is not defined. Okay. I have to give it key also is a string. So I need to give it inside the thing course. So you can see that I created two dictionaries and I have nothing but dictionary was what? creating two columns, right? Remember that? So I'm creating two columns with the values and I'm inserting it into a data frame. Data frame is nothing but your spreadsheet format. So you can see that it is nicely arranged in the format of a rows and columns 
and it has self indexed itself as well. So let's create the index, and as usual in Python, the indexing and any values starts with zero. So it is index itself from zero. Now it is able to understand this, right? So this is much much better way of doing it. And the best part is, uh, yeah, okay. One question is if a column is not passed with any values, it will automatically create it with any n. Like say for example, I have one more value here. Like say for example, variance. Arrays must be of same length. So let me say, for example, let me keep it like this. But when I insert values, I'll do it. Okay. Now let me say, for example, my, uh, what is this? Okay. First, I need to have created a data frame. Can I store it into somewhere? Yes, I can create it. So let me say I'm storing inside this data. Okay. So I'm storing it inside data and I'm just calling this data. You will get the data. Okay. So now if I have to access a column, same like what you did earlier for calling a list, right? Within the square bracket, give the column name, right? So you now you can talk in terms of rows and columns. So I if I have to list all the columns values, give the column name, you will get it. If I have to call for column price, you can call it like this, right? So you can get, you can access all the values in a column directly by calling the column name. So easy, right? So now, now if you want to access a column, you can do it like this, okay? Now say for example, if I have to find out, okay. One question someone is asking is how do I add columns? Okay, okay, so I can you can add columns. So like say for example, data. If I have to add something called as year, specify year. Okay, mention this as year. And if you put run this, it will create a year column, but it will not have any values inside. It will create any and values for all the five data. But if you want to hard code it into some values, say 2021. Run like this. Now, if you call data, now you can see that it's hard coded 2021 for everything. Okay. Got it? Or if you want to create a new column, like say twice price, price multiply by three. Okay. So I'm just creating a new column called price multiplied by three. Okay. You can see what I'm trying to do. So what I'm trying to do is I'm taking the price. So I'm going to take data dot price. So it's you can easily access data as the table. Just imagine as a table. Table dot column will give you data dot price, right? Data dot price and multiply it by three. It will do multiplication of every value here and it will create a new column called price multiplied by three and it will put 95 into three and put the value over there. Okay, let me see if what's happened. Got it? So you created a column and it's multiplied 95 into three and store it over there. So it's so easy to work with data, right? So if you want to delete it, del, okay? And then say, you can either say data dot, the column name or within square bracket give the column name both of them works fine so then call the data you see that it is deleted okay so so simple data is not defined Okay, data is not defined means then, then you have an error here itself. So when you create the data frame, you need to store it inside data, right? So I'm just create the data frame name as data. Okay, so if you're getting data is not defined, then you're getting your, this step is itself is not working. Only if this works, your data will get defined, okay? That's good. Okay, so now if I have to, uh, 
enter in values okay like say for example you want it starting from 0 to 1 to 3 but if i have to create my own index like say i want to create a sequence okay so you already saw that a range function allows you to do that right so let's say for example i'm creating a sequence but what do i have to create i need to call the range function so numpy has it another a range starting from one how many records are there i think five records right Four, four. One, two, three, four, right? So I need to give five. Always remember till five, right? So now if I create right? you can see that a sequence is got created, which is having one, two, three, and four. So what I've done is just created a sequence column, which is having a range starting from one till five. We already saw that, right? So it will not include five, and that's how you create a sequence. You can. Okay, good question. So, how do I create different years for different um, companies, right? So, that time you need to use something like this, right? So, you need to specify it explicitly. Okay. Yeah. Put it in this way list and then pass it. That's it. Okay. That's good. Perfect. And if you do not know the column name and if you want to drop a column by its position, um, you can do that as well. Data dot drop. And if you want, have to put it, uh, say, second column. So, what's happened here? Tell me. Exactly. So, your row number of index two will get deleted if you're not specifying anything explicitly if it's a column or not. If you want to mention it as uh, a column to be deleted, you need to put it as comma axis is equal to columns. Only then it will take it as a column. Otherwise, by default, it will take it up the row and delete it. Okay. All right. Sounds good. So let me try to create one. Data frame. Okay, so I'm gonna create a data frame and then let's see what we can do on top of it. Okay, let me. Okay, so you want more series also. Okay, so I'll try to combine everything and I'll do it in one go. Okay, so that everyone will understand it. Okay, I'm just defining a list. So you know that you can create a data frame with the help of a dictionary and key for values you can pass in this, right? You know this, right? So I'm gonna combine the use case of a list, a dictionary, a series, and a data frame, everything rolled up into one so that it will be a good recap and we can try to understand everything at one go, okay? So you're gonna tell me what I'm trying to do here, okay? So what is this? What I've created? I created a list. Very good. Okay. Now, it's giving some number. What I've created? A dictionary. Very good. Okay. But keep an eye on it. I'm using the list values here. Okay. Okay. Let me, I'll tell you how I'm joined, going to join that. Okay. So let's say, for example, company one. Okay. I'm going to use the pandas other data frame, other data structure called a series. Series is what I told you that it is an array. Right. What I can do is I'm going to use the dictionary and use the index as the list as the years okay i'm telling you again series is nothing but a array that you can define 
A1 is nothing but your dictionary and take the index as not your default index, take it as the one that I have defined here. Okay, let's see what is happening here. Okay, I've created it. So let me try to see what the company one looks like. Company one is having a index 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, and it is having values that I have defined. Got it? Now, can I create a similar one for company two and a company three? And then if I combine company one, company two, and company three as three different columns and create a data frame, it will make up a data frame, right? Let me try to do that. Okay. So now, for all the three columns, I'm going to use indexing as the same. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to say A2. Okay. Is equal to just give me some values. I'm going to say I, I have values only for 90 and I have values only for 92 and I have values only for 95. Okay. This is the only values that I have for company two. So this is company two. Company two is going to be equal to PD dot series. I'm creating a one. Again, I'm telling you use the dictionary. And here's is going to be in my index. So index is equal to years. The company two column. Okay, I have created a company two column. Similarly, I'm just copying this. I'm lazy. So copying it. A3, company three, company three, and just changing some values over there. Okay. okay. So A3, okay. So now I have created all this stuff. Okay. So I've created for company one and company two and company three. I have three columns. Now, can I create a data frame now? So to create a data frame, pd dot data frame. And within the data frame, I need to specify what is going to be my details, isn't it? Right? So I want to say, let me give my column names first. So columns is equal to, let me say, to this differentiate column names, I'm going to say firm one, comma, got it. So I'm just closing this out. So basically, what I'm trying to do here is I'm creating an empty data frame and I'm ensuring that firm one, firm two, firm three are the column names and indexes should be matching with the ones that we are given here. Okay. So Yes, I've created a data frame. See, it's created a data frame with empty columns, form one, form two, and form three, and indexes this. So let me store it as some data frame. So DF data frame, a typical one that I use. So data frame, so run it, run it. Okay, so I have a data frame. Now I have columns and I have an empty data frame. I need to pick these columns and insert it in, so into this respective columns. Okay. So now how do I do it? How do I do it? How do I call a column inside a data frame? DF dot firm one, right? And if I just give the name of the series here, that is enough. Okay, so I'm going to say this and it will automatically insert the values over there. Okay, so df dot form two is equal to two, com two form three is equal to three. So now you can see that the values are entered and your data frame is brimming with values that you have. Got it? So all that I have done is I mentioned the index, which is a custom index for me. Instead of 0, 1, 2, 3, I created a custom index. So some people are asking me, how do I change the index? Yes, this is how you change your index. So mention uh, the values that you want and call series and ensure that you get the columns correct. 
mention the columns with the correct index. Only thing that you need to carefully note that the index should be the same wherever you're creating a series or a data frame. And then I created a data frame, empty data frame with three columns and use the same index. And then I just copy pasted the series into the data frame. There you got the data frame. So now you created a data frame, right? So this is a different way you create a data frame with change in index. Okay, that's not good. Now let's do some basic data cleanup. Okay, so I'm just teaching you how to do basic data cleanup. When you take any raw data, which you will do in the next class, you will be asked to do basic data cleanup from your side. So pay attention to how you do cleanup. Okay, so you have a data frame with rows and columns. The first thing that strikes you, you have a lot of NA in values, right? How do I delete NA values? Okay. So we can do that. You can clean up all the data NA values. It will, what it will do is, if you have NA values in any one of the rows, it will delete the whole row. Okay. If you look at this data structure, you have almost all the rows are having NA values except for this row. Okay. So like say, for example, if you're going to have DF, dot drop in a and then you're going to store it into df drop df with no in a is the name of the data frame that i'm storing it into okay so if you run this you see that all the other rows are going to get deleted and only the row with no null values are retained uh, I'm losing a lot of information like this, right? So can we do a better way of doing this? Yes, take an average and replace any with average, but I'll come to the, you can do what you can do is, another thing that I've seen people do is that if all the NA value, all the columns are gonna have NA values, just imagine this is 94, the firm three is also having NA values here. Okay, just imagine like this, okay? So firm three is also having instead of what value is this? 32, right? So 32. So instead of here, I'm just putting it as 33. Okay. Just imagine this data frame. You have all these as Indian values. It doesn't make sense to have this row there. If I have to remove this row then it makes sense right but i cannot remove these rows right it doesn't make sense to remove a row just because one of those columns are having a name values isn't it so how do i do that okay so you can do it there's a added function to it that defines it what does it call is that same code that you do last time around okay i'm just going to replace it the data frame name so that it will make sense with all any okay so that you will be able to better understand that df with all any in drop any what you're going to do is you're going to put how is equal to all okay what is it trying to say is how are you going to drop the nas when all the nas are all the columns are having any values. So if you run this, you can see that only the 94th index record is deleted. This makes sense. Okay, perfect. Next question, yes, I was expecting this. I'm coming to that. So next question was, how do I drop it on the column side? Yes, you can do it. So if you want to drop it on the column side, you need to put it as the same thing, x is equal to one, right? So df if you want to have the whole thing as x is equal to one then if you have any values anywhere it will drop the whole thing okay so df column drop okay so you can see that almost all the columns are having any values so almost everything will be dropped like this so right all the columns are dropped because all the columns are having at least one of the any values isn't it perfect so now okay 
can I set a threshold for dropping the any values? Like say, only if there are more than or at least two any values, then drop it. So out of those three columns, if there are two any values, then drop it. Otherwise, keep it. Okay. Yes, you can do that. Okay. So I'm just copying this code, except that inside the bracket, you want to mention something called as threshold. So three, I'm going to say th -h, -r -e -h, h threshold is equal to specify the number that you would want. Okay. So what this will do is it's going to say at least two values, then it will drop. Okay. So it. So you can see that only 94 had more than two any values, at least two values, any values. All others had only one any values in the rows, right? So only 94 is getting dropped. Okay, makes sense? No, no, ignore. Uh, just I'm using it on DF. Okay, I'm not using it on here. Okay, if I use if I had used it with DF with all any, then the first row column would have been retained. Okay, just imagine this. For the df1, all the columns had any values, isn't it? So if I boost it here, see here, first one will be retained because the first one did not have any values. Make sense? It depends on what you're using it, right? Okay, sounds good. Perfect. Um, let's move on. Now, okay, next one is a very important one. Okay, so someone did tell me that. Can I fill the NA values with a hard coded value? Yes, you can do that. Okay. And you can also uh, fill it with average weight value. Okay. So you can do that. Okay. Now, how do I do that? So, like, say, I'm copying this whole thing. So I'm just putting this DFT to me. Um, if I'm going to drop the NA values, but replacing them with a hard coded value of, say, if you want to put it as zeros, right? So you can do that. You want to replace all the NA values as zeros. Yes, you can do that. At least you can do that. And it will find out what are the NA values. And then go, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Oops, I have not replaced DF, right? Okay, very good. So what will happen is drop, you should replace drop NA by fill NA. So what it will do is fill all the NA values by zero. Okay, so now it will do is it will replace all the NA values and you can see that it is replaced by zeros. Okay. So once you've done that, it is easier for you to do any kind of mathematical calculation of that. Okay. So I'm storing that into a new data frame, DFA. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Now, someone did mention me to me if I can fill it with the mean value. Yes, you can certainly do that. So if you want to specify this, you can. I'm just changing it to new one. So here now what I can do is fill in a and we know how to calculate the average, right? So df new is the one, calculate the mean, mean is nothing but average. Fill the in a values by, not by zero, but by the mean of the values. So run it. Now you can see that it is replacing it by me. Oh, it's wrong. It's not filling it. Why? Can someone tell me? 91 is also taken in the mean. What do you mean by that? See, I've taken df new. df new is nothing but this. I'm expecting this to pick it up from mean and put it over there. But why is it not filling in? Very simple one. Oh. See, okay, I'll repeat the question. The expectation was that now we have all the values over here. Replace the NA values by the mean. But it is not replacing, it's all kept as zero, right? Exactly, exactly, super good, exactly. It will fill NA, will only replace NA values. Now we do not have NA values here. So what will it replace with? So what should I change in my line code for it to work? On what of 
And on top of what data frame should I run this one? Exactly. So instead of running it on DF new, I need to run it on DF. Now it will. You can see that it is replacing the null values by the mean. Sounds good. Perfect. Okay. So, perfect. Okay. So now there's an another important concept that I wanted to introduce to you uh, before we call it a day today. Okay. So I want you to uh, read the files and also uh, importing the files also from the CSV files. Okay. So um, that I want you to do. And also I want you to know about passport filling and forward filling. Okay. So, okay. It's okay. We can do the importing of the files in the next class when we do the data analysis of our data, time time and data set. Okay. But let's do the uh, backward filling and forward filling now. Okay. So let me take the same data set. Okay. Sometimes what will happen is instead of replacing it by mean value, which makes sense, instead of replacing it by mean value, what some of the people will say is replace the values by the last occurrence of the value. So what do you mean by that? So just imagine that you have value for 93 and you do not have a value for 94 or 95 and they wanted this 32 to be replaced in 94 or 95, right? So how do we do that? Okay. And if you have any values in the front and you wanted those values to pick the values from the earliest occurrence of the value, right? Let's say this NA1 should be picked up and replaced by 33. The last occurrence was 33, so this should come in. Right? So let me try to do that. Okay, so let me just do a small change in the code so that you will have a code which is relevant to the values there. Okay. So let me see if I can replace this 95 by NAN so that it will then take that. We have a code like this. We don't have a value like this. Okay, so now your data frame will look like the one that I want. Okay, so now my expectation is that. Any value should be replaced by the last occurrence of the value and the previous occurrence of the values before occurrence should also be replaced by any value should be replaced by the first occurrence of the value. So these two should change to 32 and this one should change to 33. If it is in between, then you can replace it by your mean, okay, whatever you want. But the last occurrence should be replaced by a backward fill or a forward fill, right? So that's what the expectation is. So you can do that. Okay. So how do we do that? Okay. So this is called as fill in a, but there will be a new approach to it. So I'm just going to fill new two. I'm just going to change the data frame name. So fill in a, but not by mean. What I'm going to do it is you're going to do the same thing. You're going to call a method called as forward fit. So what is this trying to do? F fill. Okay. F fill is a method. Should give it as an approach. What is it trying to do? This it picks up. Let me show it to you. It's it easy. It forward fill is it will pick up the last entry and it will forward fill the records. So you will see that the two will get replaced here, three will get replaced here, and 32 will get replaced here. Can you see that? This is called forward filling. You can also do backward filling of the values. Just replace it by backfill. Okay. So you can backward fill it. Obviously, the last values, if you do not have values, it will be still shown up as near. Okay. Are you able to understand? Mean will give you the mean of the particular column. So a mean of firm two will be given. Okay. Okay. Um, one good question directly to the panelists. One was, can I set a limit? Like I can, I have to backward fill or forward fill only for one value or something. Yes, you can do that. So just add comma, put as limit is equal to one. So it will backward fill only for one value. Okay. 
and the second value will show as NAF. So it is backward filled only for 94 and 95 is shown as NAF. Okay. So it is same thing, limit is equal to one can be used here also. Okay. So limit one or two, whatever you want, you can use. Got it? So you can use it. Okay. So that works. Now, any questions? Let me take one more question before we go. Okay, another question is, okay, very good one. So what if I have to hard code, instead of putting a mean value here for any n values, what if I have to hard code one constant value for form one, one constant value for form two, and one constant value for form three? You can do that, okay? So you can do that, okay? So I'll give you that option as well. So I'm just changing it to a new data frame. So how do I gonna do this? I'm gonna replace all of this, okay? So what I'm going to do is, you're gonna fill the NA values, but how are you gonna fill the NA values for firm one, replace it by say 12 or say whatever value you want, six, right? And for firm two, okay? Replace it by, six okay and for firm three uh firm two we're gonna replace it by eight or something okay different type of space. and for firm three column if you want to replace it by a mean you can do that here also. so firm three dot mean is gonna do that okay so just imagine i'm gonna replace only firm one and firm two and leave the NA values in form three as it is okay i'm gonna run it Okay, so this is a dictionary, right? So I need to keep it within a dictionary. Okay, so you can see that firm one's NA values are replaced by six, firm two's NA values are replaced by eight, firm three's NA values are kept as it is. Okay, very good. Uh, had to do awesome um, regarding your college classes i have reached out to the college team and also to my team and once i hear from them i will get to know about it okay sounds good um, and for the exams yes you will have questions from uh, um, python as well so the number of questions i'm not exactly sure but i think you will have at least eight to ten questions and it will encompass uh, everything from first to what we have seen so far Okay, so including the one that you're going to be covering for the next week's also. Okay, so but most of the ones that are going to be done until today, you'll have it in your exam. Okay, and whatever you have tried in your class. Okay, okay, so let me take any questions that you guys have. Yes, it will be MCQs mostly. So for every NA value, if you want to do it, then you need to call a, a every cell by its row and column and then replace it, okay? So that is going to be a tough one, right? So that's something that you would not want to do, right? So, or if you want to replace one particular value by row and column, you can do that. That should not be a problem, but you cannot do that for everything. So, but there are still better methods. The easiest and the sensible method is to replace it by a mean or a median for now and then move on. But there are lots and lots of uh, different ways by doing this. Um, that's called as KN and uh, way of doing it. That is the best method. So you can do that as well. But for now, for all practical purpose, when you get started off with the exploratory data analysis on using pandas, you can always use uh, replacing the values, any in values by mean or median. Okay. So those should be fine for now. Okay. What is the difference between Panda and SQL? So SQL, um, SQL is used for querying on relational databases, right? So relational databases are used primarily for uh, storing transactional data, isn't it? So Pan Pandas is one of the uh, packages which are used in Jupyter that you can work with any type of file, right? You do not have to have only 
use only on relation database. You can connect to the relation database from Pandas Jupyter Notebook and Query also. Um, but Pandas is, Jupyter Notebook is Python Notebook is used can be used for using any type of data analysis, which is much more flexible than what you are cannot do in SQL. So tomorrow when we are going to be meeting up on next Sunday, uh, we'll be doing a data analysis on one of your real set data set. You will see that what are the different types of drilling downs, plotting, and everything that we have done over there. Okay, so that will help you to understand what type of data, data analysis that we can do. Okay, so I'm going to be teaching you how to do that. Okay. Yes, before I, I forget that, this is the end of class file. So I'm just going to replace this by end of class in the end so that you will know this. So I'm going to download it as a HTML and as an icon number so that you have both the files. Okay. I'm uploading it into the same folder where I have uploaded the previous files. Awesome. Okay. So any other questions? Like how to use MySQL in Jupyter Notebook? Okay. So, um, so you need to first make a MySQL connection and then do it. So you can use it, uh, but it has its own pros and cons, okay? Uh, but I'll give you the link, how do you have to use it so that you can uh, have it configured with it, okay? But you need to use one of the additional add-ons called Paluma, okay? So that you use it for MySQL, but normal SQL database, you can do it, okay? So you can do that as well, okay? I'll give you the code for you to do that. Okay. And this is internal code, so please be wary of using it. Okay. Okay, so obviously you need to change it according to your database, but this is how you can connect to your database. Okay. That's it for today then. I think uh, please complete your homework that I have given. Um, please complete uh, the password module and the function call. So finish that before we meet for next week. And next week we will be jumping on to our use case, real-time use cases. We'll be taking up a use case data and we'll be doing whatever we have done today, right? So first we'll be cleaning up the data and then we'll be trying to analyze the data First thing first is we're going to be asking a few business questions and we'll be trying to answer them using our data. Okay, so I'll upload the series of uh, data files into the same folder before the next class and please download those data files. It might take a few minutes for you to download the data file. So please download them and keep it so that you can uh, use it. Okay, good in class. Okay. okay, awesome. Thanks a lot, everyone. Please join on time for the next class so that we can get started off with our use case analysis and wind up our class okay so i'll get back to you guys when your exams are going to be i'll check with my team and i'll get back to you and uh, so that you will be able to get it okay sounds good thank you everyone have a good day and catch you guys next week thank you everyone bye bye